in this super duper awesome episode of Mind Pump. Everything is awesome. We talk all about fitness, health, building muscle, burning body fat, but we also talk about our lives and current events. Mm. Here's what we talked about in the first 42 minutes, which is the introductory portion of this episode. We start out by talking about Caldera. This is a new company we are partnering with. They make skin care products that are all natural. It's the reason why Adam's face and head look mm. so beautiful. It looks like the fountain of youth. Anyway, we got a discount for you. If you go to Caldera Lab, that's C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get 20% off your first purchase of their products. Then we talked about taxi cabs, uh, how some people are buying old taxi cabs and police cars and making us scared as fuck Stop at night. Stop confusing us. Yeah, what the hell? Then Adam talked about how you went into daddy protective mode. This is the first time you ever felt that feeling. Um, it's like a superhuman uh, feeling, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Then we talked about how blue light can improve late night athletic performance. Study found that uh, if athletes are going to compete late at night, if they expose themselves to bright electronic light beforehand, they perform better. And the reason for this is because it reduces melatonin production. It keeps the body awake now, if you want to go to sleep at night, like most of us, you want to do the opposite. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You want to block blue light, and our sponsor, Felix Gray, makes the best blue light blocking glasses. Now, they're not orange or red looking. They look like normal glasses. The lenses are pretty much clear, so you don't look like a dork. They're very stylish. And uh, we got a hookup for you. If you go to Felix Gray Glasses, that's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y, glasses.com forward slash mind pump, We'll get you free shipping and free returns. Then we talked about the seven biggest parenting mistakes based off of an article that I read. It's actually a pretty good article. We talked about how the feds are demanding the names of 10,000 users from Apple and Google. Uh-oh. Uh, and then we talked about a personality test that we all took. Then we got to the fitness portion of this episode. The first fitness question, what are some easy ways to spot a bad personal trainer? Like, What are some telltale signs? Mm. Next question, for a woman who lifts alone, should you ask some random dude to spot you? Like, is that weird? Is that creepy? What are the strategies? Next question. Of the three major powerlifting lifts, which ones did we have to work the hardest on to get stronger and which ones were the easiest? And the final question. This person wants to know about how we all started our careers in fitness. So we share the early days. Way back in the late 90s. Oh, yeah. Memories. Yeah, back when men dressed like idiots. Uh, they yeah. still do, though, don't they? Uh, yeah. Also, this month, MAPS Starter is 50% off. Now, MAPS Starter is the best program to get you started with resistance training. So if you haven't worked out for a long time or you're totally new to resistance training, but you want to reap all the benefits, you want to get a faster metabolism, you want to sculpt your body, you want to get leaner, MAP Starter is the perfect program. It's also a great gift. If there's anyone in your family you're trying to convince to start working out with resistance, this is the perfect program. And personal trainers, if you have any clients that are beginners, this is a great resource. Now, here's another good part about the program. You only need a physio ball and dumbbells. That's all the equipment you need for the entire program. Now, MAP Starter is 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com. And use the code STARTER50, S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0, -E no space for the discount. Did you see the company we just signed with? Yeah. You like it? I like them. What do you think? I like them, dude. I looked them do you, up. Do you approve? Is this the Caldera? Yes. Uh, Caldera. So uh, Adam's face and head have been looking... <laughs> Extra shiny. Good. Extra, extra handsome. Well, no. good. Extra handsome. Well, I mean... You, Youthful-ish? Look, here's the deal. Okay. When you're already at a 10 in terms of handsomeness... Right, it's hard wow. to get better. Improving upon that... Don't give him that big a head, dude. It doesn't... It's impossible. But yeah. it seemed to work. No, all joking aside, you're, you've are you been using it. I see you rub it on your head and your face. No, I mean, Taylor gave it... podcast. Taylor gave it to me about a month ago and uh, said, hey, I like this company. I like what they're doing. I like what they're about. Um, you know, would you use something like this? And I'm like, well, I'll try it out. We'll see what's up. And you brought it up like a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, that you, and I thought it was, oh, that's crazy. Cause I didn't tell you guys, like I didn't say anything. I didn't share with you guys. It was just, cause sometimes stuff like this comes across where, you know, Taylor will give it to one of us. One of us will try it. And then we'll be like, yeah, it's not really a thing that I think I would use on a regular basis or whatever. And we kind of just move along from it. 
And then every once in a while, one of us will like really like it and then go, okay, turn it, you know, show everybody else. So, and I actually just wrote a, um, a test no, a testimonial or whatever for their, their landing page. And what in what it's done for me that I really really like is um, I've eliminated using my steroid creams on my psoriasis. Completely, really, completely, yeah. Wow. And I, I mean, look at my shin. You guys know I have that right there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw you rubbing it on your shin one day too, as, as well as your face. So that's it's a whole. Yeah, so it started with me using it on my face, and you, I was getting compliments from you guys. I've had people tell me like how how good my skin looks right now, and I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm gonna start rubbing it on all my psoriasis spots, and I started with that, and I was doing it at the same time, still using my steroid cream. And I actually seen such an improvement on it. I'm like, let me stop using the steroid cream and I'll just keep using this. Yep. And what I like about it is it's 100% all natural. Well, that's that's the other test. The other test is it has to pass, you know, what I think about in terms of the ingredients. And it's, it, it's 100% organic, but it doesn't contain, and I have the list here, no parabens, aluminum, no animal ingredients, no toxic chemicals. There's no synthetic preservatives, no uh, phthalates, formaldehyde, or silicones. So it's... It's very, very good. It's very well made, and they actually did a uh, they actually did a study with people who used this product, um, and the results that came back uh, very good. Everybody noticed an improvement in their mm. skin. Yeah. So it's really good. Here's the ingredients that I, so they have firewood, apricot oil, jojoba oil, meadow foam seed oil, sunflower seed oil, echinacea, prickly pear oil, frankincense, nettle, red raspberry, sea buckhorn. Then there's, uh, and then uh, I already said the frankincense. I like frankincense. Frankincense, by the way. that's biblical. Frankincense is good stuff. <laughs> Did you know frankincense has anti cancer uh, effects? Does it really? Yes. Wow. There's actually studies Throw you can find on, now it's high, highly concentrated, but um, on its anti cancer effects. And there have been companies that have been interested in examining their anti cancer effects. So, anyway, it's just a little fascinating. So is this stuff. considered like an essential oil? They call it a serum. Serum? Yeah, they, okay. they call it a, they call it a, a, a serum, like a face serum. Mm-hmm. And well, most things you put on your skin that you buy at the store are because here's the here's the problem. There's a big issue. With, people are much more aware of what they put in their mouth today than ever than ever before, right? Like 20, 30 years ago, nobody was asking questions, uh, too many questions about the potential long term effects of some chemicals and. You know, preservatives and colors and all those types of things. Right. But nobody was asking, and nobody's really asking, what about what we put on our skin? Because we don't consider that going in our body. Right. You know what I mean? Even like, though it's one of the biggest organs. Of yeah. Life. I mean, there's a lot of categories like this, like uh, women's, uh, like feminine hygiene products. Uh, a lot of women don't consider the cotton that's in, in the materials in like a tampon and right. do those have chemicals and, you know, those types of things. Toilet paper that obviously touches your body in, in a you know intimate way, I guess. Very intimate. Um, <laughs> um, and then of course the stuff you put on your skin or under your arms, or, or on your scalp, you know that also some of that stuff will be, go inside your body and accumulate. This is why you know with sunscreen, um, I use uh, the mineral based sunscreens, the ones that don't that are not chemical based for my kids, mm-hmm. and it makes your skin a little bit wider, obviously. Yeah. But it's not you know I'm not absorbing chemicals that can have potential like hormonal effects and stuff I like didn't, that. I didn't think that I would like it. And then when I saw how expensive it was, I was like, Taylor, you're fucking crazy. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> what I've realized is how far it goes. So I've used the shit out of this thing for the last 30 days, and it still feels like I got quite a bit left in it still. Mm-hmm. So it's like a dropper in there? Yeah, you- it's, you're just using a little dropper. So like when you like initially when you look at it, you're like, that's because it's, it's priced pretty high. And I'm like, that's pretty expensive stuff there's so many servings in there though yes right yeah it lasts a lot and you don't need very much i literally you you pull it has a little syringe thing in it you drop it in your hands i rub it in my hands and then i rub it on my face or my psoriasis spots. so how much how many like how many drops would you say you're using when you're rubbing it all over because you you rub it on your head too yeah so it's not just your face yeah i rub my face my head and my legs right now and how many drops would you say you're using so each time so when i do my face i do a drop when i do my head i do a drop when i do my legs i do a drop Mm -hmm. so like three droppers it's not even that much wow yeah Ah. it's not it's not much at all and it lasts so i've been using it consistently for 30 days we should have justin give it a try yeah Yeah, yeah, you're ashy as fuck i I was gonna say my (laughs) my ashy gator skin over here uh i'd probably benefit from it the most but i'm glad they started with you because it's uh it's like a foreign animal this lotion and stuff like that yeah Yeah, i'm like lotion no i think 
like I, I, who, no, who does that? No, I want you to try it. I think you'll I think you'll like it. It's, I mean, I'm going to keep it in here so we can just use it in here if you're not willing to take it home and actually do it. And it's been I've I actually really liked it. I didn't think I was going to. I really kind of looked at Taylor like, eh, you know, we're none of us are really essential oil type guys. I'm not this deal. No, they want us over. Yeah, they want us over. It yeah, makes yeah. a big difference. Yeah, yeah, no, it it's does. Cool. Just some kind of soap do you do you use? Do you use like normal or are you just like a pure like a bar? You yeah. didn't care. Yeah, just like, like a bar, some dial. Yeah, it's so like whatever's in the hotel <laughs> room. <Yeah. laughs> I'm scrubbing myself with that. You, you don't use uh, what's it called? The uh, the who spring? am I joking? What's I use the, a loofah. No, you don't. <laughs> you guys don't even know. No, they don't. What's yeah, that don't one soap it. where the guy? Remember the old commercial where he he carves it with a knife? Yeah. What uh, is that? Uh, Irish, Irish spring. spring. Is that what you use? It's, I totally would. Just you know, to be that guy. You don't. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. So my parents bought Irish Spring. This is the the power of advertising. My parents bought Irish Spring once when I was a kid. We what did we use? We grew up. We used ivory. Remember ivory? Oh, mm-hmm. Mike. We grew up on Safeguard because their big pitch was like antibacterial. Yeah. Guess what? Uh, All soap. It's antibacterial. Yeah. <laughs> that was their big pitch. Yeah, my parents yeah, bought yeah. that. No, it's funny. I'm I'm more of like an opportunist. Like I I use everybody else's soap. I don't really have like my own. And so Courtney's realized like her volume's gone way down and like started buying me like the same stuff as the kids. So <laughs> she's like, you're really allowed to have this one. And and so I, yeah, I use the kids you're, stuff. Yours you're says the Rite Aid brand. Yeah. Like, all right. Exactly. I'm like suave. Dishwasher you know, soap. Like, yeah, yeah, shampoo. That's I've like been, where I'm at. I've been meaning to take a picture of this because I find it comedy every time I get in the fucking shower is I have this little corner area in the right on the right side of our shower and there's like there's like two products yeah. and then i have my bar of soap over here right and then the whole rest of the shower we have a shelf up top here we've got three other corners we have a little fucking hangy thing full of bottles and shit and i'm always I get in the shower and i'm like how the fuck does this woman use all of these things <laughs> like i literally have Three things over Dude. here total that Beauty I Beauty products are no joke. It's insane. Like the market have, is insane yeah. on their side, dude. It is, oh, it yeah. is. Yeah. No, I, I just use them. I just use I just use salt palmetto shampoo, been using it forever. Yeah, I've got the same bottle you bought me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well now you shaved, you gave up. Give it back to me. I know I still use it. <laughs> you do? Yeah, yeah. What do you just rub it in and leave it? Yeah, it's, you know, it just takes a little drop now. I don't yeah, need yeah. I don't need like a big old oh, okay. glob of it. So yeah, it's, it's I use that and then uh, little sprouts. And then I'll use sometimes charcoal soap. I'm still I'm still hoping it'll recover. Yeah, yeah. You guys ever use charcoal soap? No. You ever seen it? It's like a black no. bar of soap, and it's got activated charcoal in it. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's kind of cool. Use that a little bit. Hmm. Jessica's pretty basic, too. Her and I, just that's it. Simple, done, no B- deal. Bunch of hippies. Yep, that's it. But, you know, we don't shower, yeah. so. <laughs> just patchouli <laughs> oil. We do the, what do they call it? The, the, yeah. the, the whore bath? The bar of <laughs> You rinse <laughs> off your armpits and your- Who uh, calls it that? And your ghibli bits or whatever. Uh, <laughs> that's disgusting. Yeah. That's disgusting. Hey, hey so I had, a, I had a question for you guys, because yeah. I'm just not aware of, of this, I guess. Um what is the deal with people that buy the old uh, taxi cabs or the old cop cars and they drive them around? I hate them. They're assholes. Yeah, is I it, know. I hate those people. It, you know why? I think there's like an auction where you can get like a discounted price on them that like I've seen a commercial for this when I was in Chicago. Oh, you have? Yeah, where like you go down to this auction and they auction off like government like issued uh, vehicles and then you get a discount on it. I think that's how it works. But yeah, then they drive up and you're like confused. They're like, you're driving slow because you think it's a cop. Well, it's you. always like the the hipster or stoner guy yeah. who's driving it. Tatted up, he's blowing totally. a, blow a joint. Beard. Yes, yeah. yes. Dri- so is it supposed Aviator to- Aviator sunglasses. Like, is it come supposed on, to be funny and ironic and that's why they do it? Or is it like a killer deal? That's why or- they drink Paps Blue Ribbon Beer. Is it's that what it is? Reason. Yeah. yeah. So it's there's a guy the right now. There's a guy right now who uh, obviously gets to work at the same time I do, uh, because we've I've seen him like almost every every day on on the trip home from my house to here, and he's got one. You know, he's got the taxi cab one, and it's definitely the, you know tattoos, beard, smoking his vape pen out the window, and yeah. it's got. He's got a. He put a. The only thing about it that it's not a taxi cab, and you could see where it was because you can see still see like through the paint job. Well, they don't yeah. they don't paint it or change it. And, but he put a. He did put a white spoiler on it. Mm. Come on. Dude. <laughs> so what was your what was your favorite? It's great for picking up chicks. So do you guys have a favorite cop car or one that you always will remember the most? Like oh that's a cop car. Is uh, there a particular the Crown Victorian is like the the most memorable. Yeah one. yeah. What about the Plymouth Grand Fury? 
you know, the boxy, like, 19. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one's badass. Didn't that seem like a tank? That yeah. was, like, the one that always chased the Dukes of Hazard around, right? All, yeah. the one, all the ones in Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the Crown Victoria is the one I remember the most. Well, that was the most popular for a while. Now it's just, like, any, like, Ford Explorer or wherever you are, it's like, you don't even know it's a cop car anymore. Dude. They got I, some badass ones, though. You, some of the Highway Patrol guys the get, like, Chargers the Camaros and, and yeah. Chargers, yeah. Yeah, when I went to Monaco years ago, I remember they I saw a cop car driver drive by and it was a i think it was a lamborghini what yeah i think no they actually way. had a la yes what yes have you guys ever been to you guys You're know where smoking. monaco is i'm not have you guys ever been to monaco or know where that place oh, is? oh yeah no that's where the, the richest of the rich they all hang out there insane yeah. okay In, that makes sense there. insane bro the taxi cars the taxi cabs were like the top of the line AMG Mercedes. That was the taxis. I have seen that. Up. I have seen that. Yeah, it was. It was. I went to the the. They have a casino there that you have to pay to get into. It's like a famous casino, and you walk. <laughs> already, in. they're winning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you assholes. What a bunch of assholes, right? <laughs> the odds are already in your favor. Listen, you you got to pay to lose here. You know why okay. they do that? You know why they do that though? Is because tourists want to go in and just walk around. Sure. Because you walk in there, and the cheapest table I saw. This was back in 2006 or seven. The cheapest table I saw was a 5,000 euro minimum bet. Damn. That's the minimum. And I see these guys were like, they were betting chips. And it was like, I was trying to count a little bit from the side. I'm like, dude, he just did a 150,000 euro bet. What a weird tourist like attraction. You know, like right. I want to go see rich people in their environment. That's it right there. Doug, you just pulled up. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, reminds me of have you guys ever seen uh that that tour company that like goes through Compton and like all these other places where the gang wars happen all what? the time? Yeah. That's a tour company? There's a tour company down in, in LA that like just takes, <laughs> no, it takes I swear to God. No dude. Yes, dude. Yeah, they go like, ooh, look at like the gangs, like check this out. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like it's, it's so ridiculous. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. I had an exciting day the other day. I saw a, a drive exploitation <laughs> of like yeah. So listen to what happened to me uh yesterday, and this was like a weird feeling that I had. I didn't like uh, I didn't know how to react or respond to was it. Was it just that the the sexual feeling you had about Justin? <laughs> yeah, that no. conversation. Dude, that Dreams are not real, Adam. I'm used to that feeling. Okay. Already. okay. I'm already, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's not it's, weird. No, it's, yeah, yeah, don't, it's not weird. Don't, don't go with it. So Danny and I are, Danny comes over yesterday and uh, spent some good time talking to him about business stuff and things that they're working on with the YouTube channel, yada, yada, yada. We are, I, I, I take the baby from Katrina, put him in his, his little uh, Bjorn thing or whatever, and I'm walking with him. He's asleep on me. And Danny and I are talking and we're, we're, we're walking the loop. And I live in a, I live in a really nice neighborhood. And so most of the time when we're walking, there's always just like other families walking us for that. And there's this dude that is walking in the middle of the street and he's got a bottle in his hand and he's yelling at somebody. And I don't even know who the somebody is. And it's just kind of strange. Never seen somebody like this in our neighborhood. I've, this is the first time I've experienced this. And he actually starts walking like directly towards me. And Danny, and I've got Danny with me, and we're but I've got the baby on my on my chest, and he's sleeping. And what I what I had a real what it was weird for me was I instantly like the hair on my neck like stood up, mm -hmm. and the guy comes over. It's obvious he's he's extremely drunk, and he's like he's getting he's super close. He gets like hella close to me, and I'm trying to be really friendly, and I and I end up being extra friendly. But I, what I catch myself like I'm I'm in this moment of like. Uh, how I should react and what I'm struggling with. And I'd never thought I would struggle with something like this is, and I, I don't know if it's because Danny's there also, or I'm, I'm concerned to other people coming by, like how I'm going to react to this situation. But my instincts were like to say something like, get the fuck out of here, bro. You got your kid. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. I have my kid mm -hmm. and like, I mean, I feel my, I feel my palms sweating. Mm -hmm. My, my, my fists are kind of clenching because I don't know what the fuck this guy's doing. And he's obviously hella drunk. He's lifting his shirt up. He's talking about the cops coming after him. And like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's like super weird and uncomfortable. Wow. Now, it ends up diffusing. He walks, so he gets a separation from us, and Danny and I kind of take a left. But the part that I was, I was struggling with is this, this inner battle that I had. And I couldn't wrap my brain around like why I was struggling that way because I think I was concerned of like, 
<clears throat> like people, what they would say if I was judging this person or, you know, how I react if it was appropriate because, you know, the guy didn't do anything. Nothing happened. He didn't have a gun or a knife or a weapon on him. It all it all worked out fine. Yeah, but you got your kid with you. Right. It, it ele- it's really elevates that yep. to a whole different level. Right. And yep. and, and I was thinking- like, like, think about like you walking around and, and you walk by some kids, you know, smoking a joint at the park by mm-hmm. yourself. You don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. Now you got your little kid playing there. This and, happened to me. And then then you got these kids smoking joints around them. Now you're getting fucking irritated. That's yeah. it, it, it's just it just elevates everything. Dude, I caught myself with that. Like there was uh there, there's this it's not a park, it's like a private uh uh like this conference center that's like close to my house. And so I was down there, you know, and I brought my kids down there to to throw the ball for the dog and all that kind of stuff and there's these kids like, you know, hot boxing their car, something we would have done when we were younger or whatever. And uh they're blowing all this smoke out and it's the middle of the day. And then one of them got out with a joint and they're smoking and, and, uh, you know, the kids were playing out on the field, but it was like close by. And I just was like, I couldn't help it. I like went up to him like, you guys got to leave. You, you can't do that. Like out in public right here. My kids are out here. You got to take it off. You know, like I had to turn into the guy yeah. that was the, you know, that, that, that sort of parent figure back in my day where I would just be like, ah, you know, the like, only thing that kept me like semi calm about it was that I knew I had Danny next to me and there was two of us. So like if something went down, you didn't feel as threatened as threatened, but it mean, it, I was threatened enough to where I was posturing up a little bit, but Isn't also weird? still, it was very weird. Yeah. And after the fact, after a diffuse, we left it's your protective mechanism. I thought, fuck bro. If Danny wasn't there, I don't know how I would have reacted. Yeah, you probably wouldn't have let him get close to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you would have probably beelined it somewhere else. Yeah, you don't want. Yeah, you probably. You, and it, you got to be. God, man, it get it got away from me one time. That feeling got away from me once. I told. I think I told you guys a story. I was driving. Oh, the basketball. Yeah, I was driving home yeah. from my my parents' house. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Story. And I had my daughter in the trunk in the back, and my son was sitting a little further up. And these kids were playing basketball. I don't know how old they were. Probably 15, 16, 17. And I think one of them thought it'd be funny to throw the basketball at the car as they drove by. And it hits the window right next to my daughter, bangs off the window. And in- instinctually, I'm thinking... If that's shattered. If that's shattered. Yeah. And so I fucking pulled over. Instant and, gorilla. And I, I, <laughs> I fucking picked up their basketball hoop. Ah, they fucking... Ah, oh, they man. threw it. And they all scattered and ran away. And I was like, what did I do? Yeah. I would have never... You know no, I, mean? I could totally empathize with that. Actually, I just remembered this one. I might have told you guys about this or not, but I was at a coffee shop and this guy... Uh, I was with my kids and my do- and I had the dog with me too. I was downtown Santa Cruz. And uh, there was a guy in the corner that... Uh, I wasn't aware of. I was getting the drinks. The kids were standing over in the corner holding the dog. And they were both, you know, they were just like minding their business, just standing there like and the dog was sitting. It was like like a picturesque kind of a, a moment. This guy decided to ask my oldest if he could take a picture of them. And he didn't ask me. I was getting the drinks. I was over here. He asked the kids. And then he takes a picture of them. And then <laughs> Ethan feels kind of like weird about it he comes up to me he's like he's like dad uh this guy like took a picture of us and i'm like what (laughs) (laughs) who is this guy you know like yelling it like out all out loud and crazy you know and then then this guy kind of looks up like really scared and he's got these like weird round spectacle glasses on he's like an older guy and i'm like oh you fucking pedophile i'm like (laughs) like beeline it right to this guy and i'm like did you just take a picture of my kids and he was like He's like, yeah, I asked them. I'm a photographer. And he got like kind of shaky and he was like, you know, here's my website. And he like pulls up his his computer. He shows me all his pictures, like all this kind of stuff. And then I started to kind of calm down and I was just like, I was like, I was like, you really should have asked me. Like, and and then he, and he kept going through it and he's like, is this okay? And I'm just like, and I it, it took me like a while to to consider whether I was okay with it or not. Oh wow. And 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 I was just like, like smash your phone right in front yeah, of me. Yeah, I was just like, do I do <laughs> I poor guy's like a professional photographer? Yeah, break, I was break like, your camera, then you can leave. <laughs> yeah, I was like break d- your d- camera, I'm gonna break your fucking face. Conflicted, man. <laughs> like I was like, do I punch it this guy or do well, I let it go? This guy got I like, let it go. I mean, this guy got within you know, inches. And the uh, problem is you have your boy strapped to you. In front of me. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I could, it was, I like, I wanted to swing on him right away just for coming that close with oh, me. God. Like, I feel like you shouldn't, I have a baby on me. Like, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Back off. Dude. Yeah. Like you shouldn't even come in that, oh, that close to space. And if Danny wasn't with me, I don't know what I would have done. 
I I would have been I was already on edge with him there, and that was the only that made me feel like okay, if this dude, what if this dude tried to grab the baby out of me? You know what I'm saying? Or had a knife or had anything like, oh, dude. Jesus. I remember once back when I was married, my son was I think he was two years old, one maybe one and a half. He was in the car. Uh, my my at the time my my wife put him in the in his car seat and she walked out. I was upstairs. I was already upstairs. Uh, I was doing something on the computer. She walked inside real quick to grab something, uh, or no, walked to the porch to grab something. So the car door is kind of open. The neighbor's dog runs and jumps in our car, and it's a friendly dog. He's a it's a big dog, big dog, friendly dog. Now my my ex is, doesn't like dogs. She's not cool with dogs. They scare her. But I hear this fucking scream like a like a banshee Rah! and i look out the window like what's going on and there's my fucking my ex-wife she grabbed the big ass dog and fucking chucked him Whoa. out the car and then she st- she runs up to the owner and she's like gonna fight the guy so i run downstairs and i defuse it but it was her mom instinct that kicked in because she saw the dog jump in the car with the baby so oh, she thinks yeah and i never i couldn't believe it i'm like wow you <laughs> you grabbed that big ass dog <laughs> and threw it out of the car. But you know that parent instinct is yeah, is, is it gives you superhuman ability. Well, for it. me, like I heard the scream, I look out the window, and I jumped down the stairs from the top to the bottom and got out, and then I kind of calmed down, you know. Oh yeah. But you get that instinct that kicks in. Remember that? Remember you know the story I told you years ago where I heard something shatter outside my my. My in my backyard, oh, it sounded yeah. like someone broke into sliding. Two steps you were down the yes. stairs before I woke up. Oh, I, I can't downstairs. wait till you have one of those, like because <laughs> it happened to me too. Like my kid was like, "Whoa!" slightly imbalanced and was on on this uh, on this hill and started to fall, and it just out of the corner of my eye I saw it, and then I just jumped and just <laughs> well, and, like, I was there. It was I, weird. Well, I've already had moments already where you know he's lying next to me or whatever with that, and I I doze off and fall asleep, and then a noise startles and you you shoot. Right up, you know yeah. what I'm saying? It's a weird. It is a weird feeling with adrenaline. I yeah. yeah, prepare. Yeah, <laughs> right away. Yeah. And he's like sleeping still right next to me. It was just like something. I hate that because if if I hear a noise in the middle of the night that sounds suspect, and I wake up that way, I can't go back to sleep. I know. I'm hyped now. Now I'm ready to rock and roll. Like I went. Like all right, I'm gonna go work out because I feel like <laughs> I feel like I just took a pre workout. We can only bottle that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Turn it on. Yeah, that'd be the up. ultimate pre workout at yeah. the right moment. Well, that yeah. was that was my first experience of something like that, and I still am trying to wrap my brain around. Uh, you know what? What that could happen to me again next time, but I'm by Bro, myself. That's and like, why I. You know what do I do in that situation? Like I'm not. I'm sure as shit not going to take a chance. That's you know why saying? when like, I see these yeah. like when I see these pushes for um and and this is not a pro or against vaccine at all. That's not where I'm going. But when I see these pushes for like these local governments or state governments that are going to force uh, parents to vaccinate their kids, I look at that and I go, that's the never force parents to do anything that they don't that they think is dangerous to their kids because you are asking for trouble because that instinct kicks in whether they're right or wrong right that's f- applying force that way that's a losing battle or, yeah. or it's going to cause some problems well you know especially, what I'm especially to that you know i just told you what my experience was with that we watched like, them yeah, yeah fucking broke my heart <laughs> yeah. like someone was just stabbing yeah. my now kid. imagine yeah, if man. you were forced <laughs> yeah, yeah i know sorry sir yeah, yeah and you were officers anti- holding oh, oh yeah. Yeah. hell no <laughs> absolutely not you ever watch the videos of kids like when they're going through like the the what the is it the tsa thing? or yeah. whatever and they're like, sorry, sir, we're going to have to search your five-year-old daughter. I'd be like, oh, no. well, guess what you can do? You can take well, me to jail. Actually. Because I'm not <laughs> going to let not you. not happening today. Say, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I want to tell you guys a study about, um, I've been doing a lot of reading on the effects of blue light. You know, that's the the light that, um, that electronics really emit um, quite powerfully, the effects on the body. And we've looked at all the negatives of blue light, right? Like, yeah. If you're exposed to blue light within like an hour or two of going to bed, it dramatically reduces melatonin production, decreases the quality of sleep, um, and potentially can lead to a whole host of, of health problems. Well, there's also a positive to blue light. They did a study with athletes, and they found that if they exposed the athletes to bright electronic light or blue light, before an athletic event that they would perform better if the if the event was done late at night. Wow, like heighten their senses? Well, because, the you know, like when the Olympics are happening, a lot of times events will happen in the evening. Well, yeah, it keeps them up. Mm. And it, yes. It, it stimulates it, them. It reduces melatonin production and tells their body <clears throat> it's still daylight because one of the reasons why athletes will perform worse late at night is because their body is 
is geared towards preparing for sleep. Just start shutting down. Yeah, yeah, so they did this study where they shined, they, they had these uh, people uh, exposed to blue light and then did uh, like all out on a cycle. And they found they performed better when they were exposed to blue light versus when they weren't. So, moral of the story is: yeah, don't if, worry. Your, don't if worry. You your are going, if you are going to be cycling at midnight, that you should don't worry about wearing your blue blockers. Don't wear your Felix Grays. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, not. Yeah, if yeah. you want to sleep, <laughs> you should probably wear your. Fe- but how funny is that? Like yeah. the opposite, you know. Obviously, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. That makes yeah, that makes a whole lot no. Of that sense. I mean, of all the things that we've talked about, uh, the benefits of it, and you know, I use them. I don't know. I might use them the most out of all of us. I, I use them quite often. Uh, I, I find a lot of value even just in the in, during the day when I'm looking at my phone to just the eye strain. I can feel mm-hmm. a difference when I do and I don't. But the number one thing is just the, the sleep. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've just made a good habit of when it when the sun goes down, like I, I th- make sure I throw them on. I just want to make sure. You know, you know, it's funny. So we had friends over last night for dinner, and um, you know we're hanging out, and at 9 p.m. We turn the lights off or down, and we use the salt lamps. Oh, even you when know? you have your friends over, and we just do it because it's a school night. My kids are going, you know, they're going to go to bed. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed such a big difference. Here's what happens: if you do it once or twice, you might not notice. Once you do it, it's like eating healthy. You eat healthy for three months consistently, then you notice a big difference when you go and eat shitty. The, the contrast is just it's yeah. too it's too obvious. Well, if you make if you have a sleep routine and you do you know an, you know, a couple hours before bed blue blockers, dark light, no electronics, that kind of stuff. Do it for like 30 to 60 days. You will notice such a big difference that when you go over someone's house and it's like 10 o'clock at night and their lights are on full blast, you're just like, oh, (laughs) you can feel it. So they're they're over and we start dimming the lights and turning things down and then they're asking us questions. They're like, like, oh, they're swingers. Yeah. 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 Oh, Why is this music yeah, on? Why am I taking my clothes off? Yeah, what's going on? Yeah. No, but we're, ex- we're explaining it to them. We're telling them like what we're doing. And they have a little two-year-old boy, and he has trouble sleeping. What's funny, because he started to wind down, because mm. it was dark or whatever. And it's like, this makes a big difference, you know? Yeah. Anyway, speaking of, speaking of kids, I read this cool article. Um, uh, it was The title of it is The Seven Biggest Parenting Mistakes That Destroy Kids' Confidence and Self-Esteem. And oh, thought, Interesting. I thought this would be really good, uh, a really good discussion for us. So number one is letting your children escape responsibility. Mm. I think that's an obvious one, right? Where if the, you know, uh, to uh, us maybe, not to everybody. Yeah, like like having responsibility and doing that responsibly just makes you feel more confident because you can handle more. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the strategies that they use. Have you guys ever heard of those camps that they'll like? Some parents will send their kids off to, like they caught their kid, their kid yeah, smoking ref- too like much weed. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they'll go off, they'll go off onto these camps to try and change them or whatever. One of the strategies that they use is they give the kids lots of responsibility. Mm-hmm. So they'll take like a troublemaker, and they'll say, "Hey, you know, John, look, uh, you're going to be in charge of your group. There's four kids in your group. You're in charge. You're in charge of finding the campsite. You're in charge of getting the whatever. And then the reason why they do that is this is inc- it's so effective at getting them to step up to the plate. Yeah. So the escape responsibility. Make sure your kids have responsibility. Another one is preventing them from making mistakes. So you got to let them uh, make their own, make some mistakes. Which is where I could totally see a lot of parents having the one of the hardest struggles with. Right? Yes. Because like, yeah, you, it's so easy to intervene and then make that that a lot easier and, and help them. Uh, you know, when they when they are going through those challenges, but to really like let them sit in it and work their way out of it is that's something like a skill you develop as a parent. It is not easy at first. Well, this is this one Jessica helped me a lot with because she would tell me some, things like, um, "It's better that they make the mistake now when they're kids yeah. than than they make the same mistake but when they're adults because it's usually much bigger, much bigger problem." And I think that's absolutely true. Like, I'd rather have my kid fuck up on a test in fourth grade than lose their job, you mm-hmm. know, over, over making a similar type of mistake. It's un, it's interesting. Most of the things that you're probably going to list right now, I'm sure align right in line too with like leadership. It's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing in business. It's mm-hmm. the same thing when you're managing a team of people uh, yeah. and you have these natural instincts of like, oh, you know, you want to tell them what they're doing wrong or fix it, but there's value in allowing some people to figure that out for themselves mm-hmm. and then come to that conclusion. There's now, a lot that they learn in that. Here's a here's a good one. Protecting your kids from their own emotions. Hmm. So it's like, you know, it says here, it's tempting to cheer your kids up when they're sad or calm them down when they're angry. But rather than doing that, it's, it's better to have them identify why they're feeling the way they're feeling Absolutely. and talk about it. Unpack yeah. it. 
rather than being like, oh, you're sad. Let's go have ice cream or whatever. I'm going to cheer you up, you know, type of deal. I, I thought that was pretty good. Hmm. Here's a big one, and I see this one happening a lot today, condoning a victim mentality. Mm. This one's quite common nowadays. Here's the quote that they use that I thought was really smart. Um, Saying things like, we can't afford new shoes like the other kids because we come from a poor background. That reinforces to the child that most of life's circumstances are out of their control. That's the victim mentality. It's focusing on the things that we don't have control. This is just the way it is. Rather than focusing on you know the the stuff that they can change or whatever, right? That's a, that's a common one that's made a mistake. Like it, how how often has a parent had a kid who comes up and says, "Hey, mom, I want a new pair of these one hundred fifty dollars Jordan shoes or whatever like that," and their just response is, "We can't afford that." Yeah, you know, versus like trying to say like, "Okay, well, those are expensive. Let's figure out a way that we could buy those," mm-hmm. you know, and help the kid try and troubleshoot and figure that out mm-hmm. versus just accepting that like, and oh, also why they want them so much. Right, right. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Here's another one: being overprotective. Obviously, that's a that's a that's a big one. Uh, parents try to to prepare uh, the world for their child um, rather than preparing their child for the world. Um, you know, the world's going to be hard. It's going to suck, and shit's going to happen. So it's better to kind of not be so overprotective and kind of sugarcoat or bubble wrap everything. That one's a tough one for me. I have a natural protective instinct that I want to kind of you know help things out or whatever. But so I think that's a good one. Expecting perfection, that's an obvious one. And then punishing rather than disciplining. Explain that. Yeah, so so kids who are disciplined think, I made a bad choice. Kids who are punished think, I'm a bad person. Mm-hmm. So discipline gives your child confidence that they can make smarter, healthier choices in the future, while punishment makes them think they're incapable Mm. of doing any better. Right, like this is, you're bad for doing this versus, hey, because you made the decision, you're grounded for no reason. Yeah, point. like like you're a dumb kid instead of you made a dumb decision. Right. You know what I mean? And I think it's tough because like, I don't know, at least with my kids, they've, the, sometimes they will get that in their head that, and then they'll, they'll, they'll vocalize it. Like, oh, I'm so stupid. Mm-hmm. Like I, I did something. Like, and then I'm just like, uh, me and Courtney both were trying to reiterate, like, this is exactly why this is happening and kind of bringing it back to the choice that led to this, uh, you know, consequence. And and it's not, it has no reflection of who you are as a person. This is, this is the decision that we're focused on. That's all. Yeah. Make better decisions type yeah. of deal. Anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. No, that's really cool. Dude, did you hear about um, the feds and what they were demanding from Apple and Google? No. What? So the feds went to, to Apple and Google and de- and demanded that they hand over the names of over 10,000 users of a particular gun scope app. What? Yeah, so there's an app for a, this gun scope or whatever. Um, and apparently, and this is unprecedented, like never before have, uh, have they disclosed to us, because the feds told the media, Never before have they demanded personal data of users from a single app. Kind of crazy, right? I mean, it's it is crazy. I mean, is there logic behind that? They're they're trying to find well, was people that are like really interested in in that. Type well, so of- nothing happened. I was gonna say, was there? I it and before we get, get all alarmist about this. I mean, I could see that if we just had some sort of a terrorist. Terrorists and they're connecting it or whatever, and, and, trying and, to and, and, and a gun that was found had this specific scope on it, and so they're trying to find who could be a part of this group. Well, there's it says that there's this is part of a broad investigation into possible breaches of weapons export regulations. So they're they're looking into illegal exports of particular scope, um, and then mm. the app that maybe works with it or whatever. I don't know, it's kind of crazy, it's kind of interesting, but I, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that crazy. You know what I mean? I would be more afraid of them going after. Like, if you get a court order and a warrant, then then that's not a problem. You know, because we were we've always been able. to They do went that. through the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when I get afraid when they don't. Yeah, they when, just override the company and are like, we're taking this. Yeah, or we're going to figure out how to find this ourselves and not tell you. Yeah, you know, and not be public with it yeah. either, because I'm sure they've done that a bunch. I go back and forth on how I feel about things like this because I I, I can see, I can see the value of it. Um, for for protecting mm-hmm. us or solving something right like for example let's think of an extreme ex- extreme possibility right uh there was a attempt of a terrorist attack it got spoiled behind the scene is left this scope 
It's a super rare scope by a super rare company. They're trying to find out who. Right. And they're trying to match who that potentially is. This is one of the probably the best ways to do it is somebody who's connected to this group. Yep. Uh, but then I also see for sure uh, everybody freaking out. Oh my God, Facebook, I mean, this company is the government's going through all of my personal information. Well, if you're not one of the people that was trying to, you know, uh, were a part of this terrorist attack, you're probably going to get overlooked really yeah. quick. No, that's, that's perfectly in line with due process. So, mm -hmm. due process says there's an investigation or something happened. We want to investigate these people. We go to the court. We ask for a warrant, which is basically permission. And they give him limited access. Yeah. So like they say, hey, we think Adam is part of this whatever. We would like to um, we'd like to wiretap him. We'd like to follow him around and wiretap him. So then the judge says, okay, what are your reasons? What's your potential evidence, whatever? And they get a warrant and then they can do it. No problem. The problem that, that I have is when they don't get a warrant and they broadly search everybody mm -hmm. and they capture everybody's data, everybody's information, and then they say, oh, if you did nothing wrong, there's nothing to worry about. Uh-uh. Like that is ex that is explicitly- Well, then, uh, then here's the, and I'm just playing devil's advocate with you though, is, you know, here's the challenge with that is some, like, something like due process is the, how long that process takes and if there's something that's time sensitive- Hmm. What if at that same scene we find out that it's we're in the middle they were in the middle of plotting a second act that's supposed to happen a day and a half from today or two days from now, whatever. And so now we have to try and put this all together as fast as we possibly can so we have an a, a, an ed, a competitive edge on on stopping it. Getting a getting approval um, for something like that actually isn't that long. Uh, it's it's a, it's actually a quite fast process. It's not it it's not the issue of something happens and we need it to happen. The argument and then we need you know access to to follow people or whatever. The argument they make is. We want to look at everybody all the time. Then we can prevent something from happening. Mm -hmm. Or when something happens, we already mm -hmm. have the information. Yeah. But the problem with that is they put everybody in that. Then, and, we, then we look like the the Wesley Snipes and yeah. uh, you have that probable and, cause. And Stallone movie. What was that? Judgment. Uh, what was that? You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, Wait, Demolition Man. Demolition Judge Man. Dread. Oh yeah. Joe, Judge, is it Judge Dredd? Which one is it? Where they they have all the. You know, the predictable. They can't That's swear. No, no, oh, no, no, that, swear. Is that is that uh, is uh, Judge Dredd. No, no, no. I know what he's talking about. Uh, it's Demolition Man. It's it is Demolition Man. Yeah, okay. Demolition Man. Where if they say a bad word, the little yeah. thing yeah, yeah. comes out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you said a bad word. And then Taco Bell's a fancy restaurant. Yeah. Sandra Bullock's oh, in that, right? I remember right? that. Yes. Yes. That was a terrible movie. And they, they, don't have, they don't have sex anymore. Yeah, they just dude. connect with those helmets. Oh, yeah. lame. You know what, though? Sometimes those movies got some pretty good, you know, interesting predictions. No, because it's yeah. it's the extreme version of what you're saying right now. Like, it, that's the that's where it could lead to. So that's where I think, and which is what's great about movies about that. So we well, dude, see, it's like, not that I'm telling you. It's safety and freedom. I mean, that's the the conundrum. Never it's, trade the never trade safety for freedom. Yeah, it, it never turns out well. That's all. You just look at history; it'll tell you every time. But it's it is entirely plausible that in the future they will be able to uh, read your mind pretty much and let you know kind of what you were thinking or or you know they've done this with monkeys. You know that right? They've they've hooked up monkeys to, to <laughs> machines and they can. The computer will create the image of what the monkey's thinking of, which is kind of weird. Um, and some of the images the monkeys are thinking what of, by the way, think are of? fucking terrifying. Yeah, I want to know. <laughs> you can pull it up and you can see, and it's terrifying. Like, I didn't ah, know let this. Me was, out of here. I didn't know this. Was <laughs> just a, real a banana. <laughs> <laughs> it's, banana. It's just a big banana a big poop yeah, yeah that's it yeah. i yeah. didn't know that was a real thing really? they can act yes dude the technology is getting to the point where they'll they'll get to get to the point where they can literally start to read your fucking mind bro dude and so there's there's scientists that are they're saying hey we need legislation to say that you can't you yeah. can't just go around you reading people mind scan everybody yeah you imagine every i'm are having arguments with people that would suck I mean, look yeah. how we just did. That. I know what you're thinking of. Like, yeah. fuck. We just did that personality test. I think that's that's evolved a ton since that first started. I remember those things. We've done a few of those now. This was like a totally different feel for sure. Yeah, yeah. they're getting better. They're getting more and more accurate, man. The, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, you know the thing about personality tests that makes them inaccurate though is that your own self awareness. Yeah, you're projecting that, not somebody else. Yeah, like like if it, like if the question is like you know. Um, I'm the life of a party. And someone might think to themselves, like, I want to be the life. You know, they might, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. Like somebody near you. You're, like, you're never the life of the party. Not that what are you cool, talking bro. about? Yeah. <laughs> I'm always cool. in the corner just like, yeah. yeah. I feel like this personality test should include 
friends. Like yeah. I answer them for, and then you actually, answer for me too. Like, actually, like that, your friend validates that. That would yeah. be yeah. really fun. Is to now now that we've all done them, fill one out for each other. Yeah, it's like I'll fill yours out, you fill mine, or oh, Justin's wow. out. That would be interesting to see how close. We, I don't know though. I feel like when you read yours, I'm listening to it. I'm like, I mean, I definitely agree with what it kicked out. Yeah, you know. So if I had to go to the individual questions, I I, feel, I, I, feel like I, could, I could nail. Yeah, most but of them. I don't feel like I'm amazing like Adam, dude. This that's, that's I know you weird. guys got the same one. Yeah, it's weird. That's because I mean I do, but you copy all my answers and everything I do. That's why. <laughs> That's uh, you know I wait till the end just specifically to, to Adam, make your points. Better. Adam, you got to put the binder around yeah. your test like yeah. when you're in school. Yeah. That like, fucking asshole. Like I have kid. to define all of his language. Yeah, yeah. That's why we, library. That's why we made a good team for so yeah, long, for bro. Sure. We are. There's a lot, but there was enough. Di- if you looked at the percentages, we were off quite a bit on some things. Mm. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. No, it it cool. made sense. First question is from Sean and Bolt eighty four. What are some easy ways to spot a bad personal trainer? Mm. I'll tell you an easy one: eating on the floor. Yeah. Oh, that, they're wearing believe- a CrossFit shirt. How funny! <laughs> Thanks, Justin. <laughs> the dick. I mean, that's a big one. You know what, dude? It's funny you have to say that, Adam. But yeah, eating on the freaking. It's so floor. common, dude. I it's see stupid. it all the time, and it like just drives me. You ever cr- fire a trainer for that, bro? Hundred percent. Yeah. That, that that was like a no. I I get mad at the coffee cups. Like, and, and that was a pushback I used to get from trainers. Like, I'm like, it just looks fucking lazy. I'm all poured in a sport cup. I'm all, so it looks like a water that you're drinking. I don't, I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't drink on the floor. Cause I get, you need to be hydrated, but drinking a fucking Starbucks coffee while you're leaning against the machine while, while she's doing reps is just a fucking bad look. Dude, I had a trainer who was eating potato chips while training, <laughs> while training a client that's, that's on awesome. the workout floor. It's <laughs> just crumbling. Then when I bring him aside and ask him, I'm like, what are you doing, bro? You're eating potato oh, chips man. on the fucking, you know what he says to me? He goes, I, bro, I got a six pack. I know what my calories and my macros are. Like, I don't give a fuck what you look like. Yeah. You're training a client who's trying to lose weight and you're eating potato chips oh, while they're man. doing lunges. I used to get, the, used to get into onto them too. Slap it out of his hand. My trainers that would come in because we had, you know, you have, we had a break room, right? Uh, and you know, fucking go to McDonald's or Taco Bell. Hide the throw the shit outside. I know. And then they come in. I'm like, listen, I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't eat. Everyone teaches their own. But come on, man. You know. And they would say the same thing too. Hey, man, I know my macros. Look at my abs. Look how great I look. I'm like, yeah, but it's not. It's what you're the message you're sending to everybody else. Yeah. And not only that, I can you bring in that smell when you come in. I'm like, McDonald French fries smell amazing, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so like, Clients you, working out hard. Oh, I yeah. can smell French fries. Oh, yeah. that's I know what I'm doing after what this. What are you doing? That's so a yeah. psychological phenomenon. As so, you get hard, as you get tired, you start to smell the foods. That so that's your first thing is yeah, if they're yeah. if they're drinking or eating on the floor. I think that's yeah. just. A, the, I'll tell you an easy one. Um, are if is the trainer doing plyometrics with the client and having them get super tired doing the plyos? Mm. That's a bad trainer. Mm-hmm. So the the jump boxes is part of a circuit uh, or any kind of exercise that's explosive, but that's not treated as an explosive movement, but rather as a fatigue building movement that is a bad trainer and unfortunately you see that quite common yeah no i mean if they're always like constantly kind of being their cheerleader as like push through it push through it like uh, the intensity is always being highlighted all the time uh yes i'm steer clear of that for sure well that one could be a little bit harder the one that you guys just named right now because if you have the right athlete with good mechanics and there's a there's a there's a there's a purpose for their application of that that's hard but you yeah, you, have to, you know what I'm athlete. talking about. Oh no, hundred yeah. percent. And and I think that it, a, a regular person coming to the gym may not have a trained eye to see the the poor mechanics. Now a trainer will a trainer will know another bad trainer who's doing this. That's got the jump box. They've got the jump rope. They've got the you know sh- overhead press or th- squat thrusters, and they're running through the circuit. And you can see when she's doing the jump box, her knees are caving in. You know, she, her, she's thumping down on the ground every time she does it. Like her back's all rounded, like bad posture, bad form, but yet still getting pushed through a circuit. Like that's a really bad trainer. Uh, I mean, but you, I, if you see like someone doing something explosive and in a circuit, but they look like a, they look like a gazelle and they have great form and they look like an athlete, there could be an application for what they're doing. I think it's the you know the overweight middle aged male or female client that doesn't look like your athlete, and that's usually who's doing that. Right, shit. right. So that to me, I think you have to make that distinction. Yeah, case by case, yeah, for yeah. sure. With that, I, th- I I think a trainer, if you you can watch trainers train their clients, and are they paying attention, close attention to their client? Right. Um, so are they walking around the client while the client's mm. performing the exercise? Are they careful to spot the client? Um, so that if if something happens, they're there to catch the weight uh, or catch their clients so they don't fall. 
Are they watching them head to toe? Are they critiquing their form? I mean, really, that's the value of a trainer. The true value of a trainer is the application, the proper application of exercise. From an exercise standpoint, I should say, because there's a lot of value to a trainer that has nothing to do with exercise. Right. But from the workout standpoint, is the trainer really paying attention to the form? Oh, tuck your elbows, tighten up, lift here, control your rep, you know, walking around. Like you can tell when somebody's Oh, if you're a really intent. good if you're a really good trainer to me, I feel like I'll see you during your your client will be doing a set of something. It could be anything, right? And while the client is is doing the reps, the trainer is constantly moving, checking all checking checking from the side, checking from behind, checking in front, maybe even talking, giving a little feedback, you know, open up, slow down, head up, like mm -hmm. they're giving these cues while they're going through. And then when they're done with the set, you'll see the trainer normally get in and actually perform it and show the example of whatever he or she was speaking to during that rep. Like, you know, notice how your elbows were rocking like this. I want you to retract like this and hold back. And they're demonstrating it again. Like they're showing the movement they just did. They're showing it with better form. They're critiquing it. Then they're putting them back in and doing it. Like there should be a lot of movement and engagement mm -hmm. happening between a trainer and a client if you have a really good trainer. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you want to boil it down to two main attributes is how much, if you can tell that they really, really sincerely care and they're paying a lot of close attention and they're communicating well uh, with their client. I mean, those things are, you know, paramount to make a good trainer. You know, the rest of it, you can kind of tell on your own if like their experience level, because I know I sucked in the very beginning. Like I was doing some shit wrong and wasn't like too aware, but I definitely cared deeply about like, you know, getting better and then also helping my client get to where they want to get. You can also watch the clients. Do the clients look like they're enjoying their workout? And I know a lot of people thinking are thinking, oh, what do you mean enjoy a workout? It's supposed to be hard and whatever. Yeah. You can still see if somebody enjoys the workout or if they don't. Now, why is that important? Well, you're planning. If you're planning on hire tra hiring a trainer, it's probably because you want to establish a good practice, a good relationship with exercise. And if you don't enjoy your workout sessions, if you're dreading them because your trainer is whatever, mean, boring, whatever, um, you're not going to have a good start. So watch the client. Does the client look like they're enjoying their session? Does it look like they respect the trainer? And then the presentation of the trainer. This is a big one. I don't have to say this. I don't think I don't really think I have to say this, but if the trainers look sloppy, like they're not really taking their job seriously, because you see this sometimes with trainers, they're probably not going to take the actual training portion seriously. So I like the trainer that looks like they got dressed for the job. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like shirt tucked in, nice looking, you know, clean clothes, you know, ready to train their client, hair combed. Does that directly, you know, uh, communicate to the training skill and all that stuff? No, but it does tell you that they kind of took it seriously. Yeah, it's just professionalism. You know I mean? how you any other job. How you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Melissa Lenari, SYT. For a woman who lifts alone, should you just ask some random dude to spot you when you want to lift heavy? Is it weird or creepy? Hmm. Who picked this question? I did. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah, I did. I just, I, I had, first of all, I had a lot of likes from people that obviously wanted to hear the the question answered. I'm trying to put myself in her shoes, and I guess that I guess that's a really, really um, good question. It is a fair question, especially when we we encourage strength training, and uh, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a, a a lot of women I think that are really starting to move in that direction, and it's a new area. They they're, they're having to do three to five reps and that's a he much heavier load and can be scary to feel like what's to do that on your own. And also to be fair, if you're in the gym and you're a man and a woman comes up to you and says, Hey, can you help me with an exercise? You instantly probably assume she's flirting with you or she wants to talk with you. And so <laughs> I, mean, I can, that's every guy, unfortunately, yeah, I know. And I can imagine that that would be a challenge for a woman. She's like, God, I just want to spot. Yeah, like, I, I don't but, want all that, but I just actually, yeah. you know, want what I asked. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, spotters were very valuable about 20 years ago. Um, today, not so much. And here's why most gyms have a free weight equipment that you could set up to spot you. So like if, because I'm trying to think, what exercises do you really need a spotter for? Well, this is a, I was going to go the same direction as you, yeah. uh, where you're going right now. And in fact, maybe Doug, we can write this down too. Maybe Danny can shoot some videos on this. Because I don't think we've done a series on how to bail out of some of the biggest lifts. Like mm -hmm. how to bail on a deadlift, how to bail on a squat, like things to like, right. how, how to bail on that. I mean, we, it was, we were just lifting together and I had to bail uh, squatting with Justin. 
and we were caused a discussion afterwards. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you, you know, Sal was like, "Man, you bailed from that, really?" I'm like, "Yeah, no, I, I would, I always." Justin's there. I know Justin would be a great spot. I don't even ask him. Yeah. I don't want him to. I would much rather. I know my limits. I know how far I want to push. If I feel my form breaking down at all. I just bail on the exercise. I feel it's way safer. I, I agree too. Yeah, it's just like you're not so reliant on somebody else, like making sure they're really hyper paying attention and having the right, uh, you know, leverage to really help, you know, in the spots where you could just dump it. Well, and, I'm and be trying. A lot I'm trying off. to think right now. Like, what are the exercises that you would that people would really be afraid? Like, if you're using dumbbells, you mostly could drop them. Mostly squatting. Yeah, it's squatting. Overhead pressing and bench pressing, especially bench pressing. That's yeah, probably the right. scariest. Bench pressing is. But here's the thing. Most gyms will have uh, a power rack where you could set the safeties. Safety bars underneath. And yeah. you set the safety bar so that at the very bottom of the rep where it's at your chest, the safeties will catch it. So if you fuck up, oh, I can't get it up. You put it down. The safeties will catch it. Then you can shimmy your way out from under the bar, unrack the bar, and you're okay. Same thing with the squat. Same thing with an overhead press. You don't need a spotter for anything else. You don't need a spotter for a deadlift. You drop the weight. Mm -hmm. You don't need a spotter for any dumbbell exercise. You just throw them down onto the ground. Make sure you don't throw them at someone. So really, it's just squat, overhead press, and bench press, in which case, and like this is what I meant by saying 20 years ago, it was hard to find a gym that had a lot, unless you went to like a hardcore bodybuilding or powerlifting gym. There weren't many many safeties yeah. for free weights. I mean, you had machines, but they didn't have like ones for free weights. Now, if I go to ben I go to gyms, and almost every single gym I've been to these days that's got a decent weight room has safeties for their benches. Even yeah, you know, you don't even have to use a power cage. You just have the bench press. There's little arms on the side, mm -hmm. set them up so that they're down at the bottom. You don't need a safety. And, and to be honest with you, I think it's I think it's better because. Using a spotter means that the spotter also needs to know how to spot. Yes, there's a skill involved. And with I spotting. think that's I think that's what eventually moved me in the direction of never wanting a spot. Is uh, I've had enough instances where I thought I could just tap shoulder tap the guy who looks buff or looks fit. You know, come over here. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna push myself. I'm gonna do a you know one rep max. Can you spot me? And then they end up spotting me, and it ends up being worse. And then I end up hurting myself trying to get the weight up where I wish they would have just taken it up off of me. It's like, dude, why'd you let me struggle that much? Yeah. You know, and because there's a, especially in, especially in gyms, there's a lot of meathead guys that have this mentality of like, that's what it should look like. You, you know, one rep, if someone's going really heavy, they should be uh, at a sticking point. Come on, you can do this guy. And his fingers are right there. Come on, you got this. It's like, no, if I have a spot, I don't want to break momentum. Yeah. I don't ever want to get stuck and stick there because that's where the issues happen. Mm -hmm. That's where somebody that's gets where hurt. Twists and I would much rather hit that sticking point myself and then realize I'm not going to get this weight today and drop it and, drop it and mm -hmm. bail. Yeah, I think the only one I'd even consider anymore is the bench just for the liftoff, you know, just for that initial bit so I could have it like ready to go and then drop in. But I don't want them intervening at all. Yeah. And, but it's even then, like you should be able to do that first part where you unrack it yourself. And then yeah, he, no, I'd love, I'd like to be able to put the weight down. Here's what happens with a bad spotter you decide you're going to drop the, the squat uh, on the safeties, but the spotter fucking thinks they need to help you more. They so do. now they're pulling up harder on you and you're trying yeah, to let you go. You just gave them a job. So yeah, now you got to fucking lift two or yeah. they're pushing you forward. Dangerous. It's yeah. better to have, it's better to use a squat rack with safeties or a bench with safeties. Then if you can't do it, you put it down yourself. You're not, the spotter's not sitting well, there trying to lift it. I told you guys like what happened when I was squatting. I had a, I had somebody, I, I, I brought somebody over to spot me and they actually ended up like intervening so much, it, it, like right at my sticking point that they pushed me forward. And so I started to fall forward with weight on my back. That's bad, you know? And so then I ended up like falling onto my knee and then like being in a compromised position where they I had to get like more guys to come pull it off me. Yeah. It almost like injured me. Have yeah. you guys ever got stuck underweight? No. Never? No. Well, you know what? That's probably because I started lifting young in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've gotten stuck under. Oh, stuck? Like, yeah, I've had that before. Oh, yeah. Before I learned how to bail. Actually, that's the first time I learned how to bail. Really? Yeah. I, I, I had a bench. I, I was benching, man. And I, the ben the bar, I was. I thought, oh, I think I can do one more. And I was in the backyard. Mom was cooking dinner. <laughs> so she that was just me back there. Yeah. And the weight started coming down. And I was like, oh, fuck. And he was just sitting on my chest. And I remember sitting there like... What do I and I was keeping the bar from rolling back on my neck, 
So I had to like roll the bar down my body, which fucking hurts. You're yep. rolling this bar and then sit up with it across your waist type of deal. That happened to me <laughs> the quite, truth quite is, a few times. The truth is that 95% of the That's time, amazing. you shouldn't even be chasing that kind of weight that you are you would potentially not be able to get it up. You 95% gotta, yeah, of that. Going right. to failure causes that. Yeah. yeah. You, yep. you, 95% of the time, you should not ever be training that heavy that you would have to bail on a load. Now, I just said I did it the other day. And what happened? I'm lifting with Justin. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And this is we talked about this afterwards. Like, no way I would have done that yeah. had I not been all hyped up because yeah. I took a pre workout. Justin's lifting, he's <laughs> adding weight into it. I'm not going to be a wuss and be yeah. like, nah, drop the weight. I don't yeah. want to do that. This is why we don't work out so much. Tonight. Right. It's just, bro, I, two days later, he, he chooses to deadlift with me. Yeah. Uh, he's like, what am I doing? I what squat with Justin, <laughs> deadlifting with Sam. Come on, Adam. <laughs> you picked the wrong exercises. Yeah. Oh, man. So, and that's just it. It's like, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I did. It anyways, if I'm gonna do something like that, um, I and I feel myself stick to it. I'm smart enough now to know that yeah. just get out of it. You know and if saying? you think about it, if you know how to bail properly with the squat, having a spotter there only puts the spotter in danger. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. It's better that you just bail on your own. Yeah. Or what I say for this young lady, use the safeties. Go get a power. Go use the cage. Learn how to use the safeties or use the bench with the safeties. You'll never need to use a spot. That's why I think we should have yeah. Danny do a video because I think teach could, them how to do that. Yeah, we could do a really good video, especially on on bench and on squatting, which I agree is probably the two main ones that somebody needs help learning mm -hmm. how to bail on those or set up the safety racks, and then you know that's and then use it that way. Forget using a spotter. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of using somebody else as a spotter. And just keep in mind too, this is if you're training that heavy. Uh, it, it should it should be very infrequent that you're doing this. Like you shouldn't be uh, using safety bars and having to you know go to failure on at most of your workouts. Too much. Yeah, too much. Next question is from Derek McMullen. <clears throat> of the three major powerlifting lifts, which one did you have to work the hardest on to get stronger, and which one was the easiest? Oh, cool question. Yeah. Mm. So um, we're probably what, all different here too. Yeah, I think yep. so. What were your What were your top lifts in each of the three lifts? What have you, What in your life? What are the Let's start with that because I think that's a cool thing to okay. So to share. bench, mm -hmm. uh, bench three seventy five, uh, squat four twenty, and deadlift five fifty. Mm, yeah. Those are all. Those are all top numbers on yeah. on that. I did uh, 355 on bench was the most I ever did for squat was 405 deadlift was 600. Um, what about you, Justin? I'm trying to think of my deadlift because that was the weakest. I think it was only like 425 or something like that. And uh, squat squat actually like um, I got up to uh, 475. And then for cakes. for bench, I did. Uh, I got up to to four hundred five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the one that I worked on the first um, was bench press, and the the reason why I worked on bench press first was because when I was a kid, All that was the lift. Yeah. Like ben, a bench was king. Yeah, yeah. nobody cared. Like, yeah. like if, if they didn't ask you, what was your hey, what's your deadlift? What's your squat? I was always like, how much can you bench? So because there was so much importance placed on that, mm -hmm. that was the lift that I focused on uh, first and focused on it the most. Um, the deadlift came very natural to me. I'd say that the the probably the first time I really started deadlifting, I was maybe sixteen and three plates was fast. I don't remember how long it took me to get three plates, but it wasn't long at all. Um, and then four plates came pretty quick after that, and then. Uh, five plates happened in my 20s and then uh, in my 30s when I hit six. That one was really easy. Squats were also difficult, but my legs, uh, forget even though I have mobility issues in my hips, my legs get really big and strong. And so I got pretty good at the squat uh, in terms of weight. It was the bench press that took me a long time. And then eventually, I think it's what, um, the always focusing on bench press, I think it's one of the reasons why I eventually had shoulder surgery. Um, and now I never push heavy on the bench press. I have uh, my AC joint um, had to get operated on. And now I just, I, I rarely ever go above 225 on the bench press. That's probably as heavy as I, I'll, I'll go ever again. I yeah, think. we're all a little bit different, right? We're, I'm, we're, we're you and I are the same. Um, deadlift just came real natural to me. I remember um, when I first started deadlifting, I was doing like, you know, 135, like figuring it out. Like my, I mean, it was one of those exercises. Like if you've never done a deadlift, it takes a while to learn the mechanics. Mm -hmm. As soon as I figured the mechanics out, like it's when it started to, when, when it started to feel smooth quickly, I went from like one plate to two plate to three plate to four plate mm -hmm. to eventually five plate. It didn't take me long to really 
to really push the numbers in deadlift. It just felt very natural for me. And the opposite is true with squatting. Squatting has been a, a grind my whole life. And even though my squat is okay uh, and, and my bench isn't, isn't that strong, I mean, I got long limbs. So at the end of the day, uh, I, I don't think I was ever uh, built to be a really, really strong power lifter in, in, in these big lifts. But I, I, I moved the needle pretty far on my, my bench, especially when I was competing. Like that, the, a chest, obviously, your chest is a major focal point for competitors. So it was an area of emphasis for me. And uh, I remember really starting to notice a big difference when I started building my, and I also, so when I hit 375, I could hit that on a flat and I could hit that on an incline. So that's probably the, the most impressive thing about my bench was I made a point to be as strong in the incline press as I was the flat, which is not normal. No, most guys can lift significantly more on their flat than they can incline. I had a pretty well-developed chest, both an incline and flat bench, and it didn't take as much effort. Early on as a kid, uh, chest was really hard for me and bench was hard for me because my mechanics were off. Uh, and that's why I stress that even with the deadlift and all of these things, and the end squat too. Like uh, a lot of times when you really struggle with a lift, more often than not, it's you're still learning the mechanics down. And, and for me... I had uh, from all my sports that I had played, you know, and I'm left handed. I had a little bit of a, this kind of forward shoulder, and it was very, very subtle. The average eye would not be able to see it until I didn't even know and didn't put piece it together until later as a trainer. But I had like one side of my chest, my opposite side, was more developed than my dominant uh, throwing side because I had this kind of rolled forward shoulder. So when I bench pressed, my shoulder and my triceps took over the load on that one side. On the opposite side, I had better mechanics, and so my chest was uneven for a long time. So it took me a really long time to actually level that out. And when I when I learned that, saw the importance of it, I also had to stop ego lifting because as a young 17, 18, 19-year-old kid lifting, I was always trying to just keep up with my buddies that were way stronger than me on the bench press. I was weak as fuck, and my chest wasn't developed right because I wasn't doing it correctly. When I figured out how to get the mechanics right and fix my imbalance, that took about a year or two of really lightweight control, learning form and technique. Once that all came together and like I really understood how to chest press, then it, then it kind of took off and it was doing great. The hardest thing has been squat, and I think I was just sharing with you guys that um, you know I'm, that's a recent one for you. Yeah, it's it's recently finally came together, and again back to the form and technique thing is. I never really addressed uh, the the mobility thing for me. I never worked on my hips. I never worked on my ankle mobility. I had a really ugly squat. Um, even when I worked at it for a long time and got kind of strong in it, like uh, 315 was just like crippling for me for a very long time. It wasn't until I really started to dr address the hips, the ankles, get better at squatting. And then, and then now I'm actually, I'm getting close to you know, some of my peak numbers, I could probably squat 375, 380 right now. Um, I feel pretty confident about, it. and 420 is like my record record. And when I was doing that, I was actually on anabolics. So when I was 420 squatting 420, I was at the peak of my bodybuilding career. So I'm actually really excited about that. But it's been a grind mm -hmm. to get a good squat. It's mm -hmm. been a grind for me. Yeah, I think for me. Uh I was under the impression based off of all the coaches that I've had and like the programming that I was exposed to through athletics that uh, we pretty much avoided like the deadlift. It was kind of a lot like what you heard out of uh, Robert Oberst and his sort of uh, mentality towards that with, with athletes. That, that's the kind of dogma that was thrown at me quite a bit going through, you know, training. And so uh, we did do uh, power cleans and, and I really honed in on power cleans. So that was like my jam. Like I got up to like 350, uh, you know, power cleaning so I could do a, a decent, you know, <laughs> that's funny. You could power clean 350, but and you deadlift could four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I'm serious. And, and it has to be a lot of that's technique, right? And it, of course, it, it, I was completely like, to be to be completely transparent, probably the last few years is only the time I've even put into deadlifting. I've never even really tried to put effort towards maxing on deadlifts. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea, you know, if there's any potential there or not, but it's not something that I really focused on. Squatting came natural to me. That was something that like it, it felt like I could get in the groove of it, 
you know, pretty, pretty seamlessly. It was something that like felt like immediately, oh yeah, I, I get this. Like my body gets this. I could, I could do well with this. Uh, and that actually, like I, I was putting up some good numbers right out of the gates and like I was immediately jumping. They got, they had groups for, um, like I started out with like the running backs, the, the linebackers, the corners and all that, and then kind of jumped up into the linemen, uh, real fast because like, you know, I could, I could hang with all them in terms of their numbers for squat and their numbers for bench and bench was another one that came naturally to me. Uh, but yeah, it was really like the posterior chain. Like I was in, in terms of like deadlifts and, uh, like I was like any kind of pulling move was a little more difficult for me and pull-ups and all that was very challenging mm -hmm. for me. So, um, yeah, dude, I felt like I like pushing and, and, you know, and those type of mechanics, like I could, I could like seamlessly get into that. It's funny because really, really good deadlifters tend to, some of them are good at squats. Most of them are bad at bench press. Mm -hmm. It's like the things that make you really good at deadlifting, the long arms and the long levers tend yeah. to make that's you. That's what I appreciate. Bit, I appreciate that about powerlifting. Yeah, yeah, they consider that, and it's like the you know your, your grand total of all of those. You have to you know somewhat yeah. do well in all of them. I remember when I pieced together because I valued strength a lot in lifting weights. I know you, you, Adam, you probably placed more of an emphasis on aesthetics longer term than I did. Oh, for sure. I know Justin was very performance oriented, like I was. Like uh, for me, I liked building muscle, but I liked the strength of it. And I remember mm -hmm. when I figured out that, you know, if I trained with the lower rep ranges, but frequently where I was practicing two or three reps, but I was doing a three, three days a week or four days a week, I remember piecing that together. And then my numbers just whoosh, going through the roof and I loved it. And that was in my, in my early twenties. That's when I would stop the single body part, you know, one body part at a time type training. Like, you know, if I practice bench press a few days a week, Let's see what happens. And I got I got my numbers. I, I trained for at least 10 years and never knew my PR in any of those. Oh, I tested my PR first day I worked out. <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> that was the first thing I did. 10 years I trained and could not, if somebody asked that question, first of all, that question was, it was rarely ever asked 10 years ago. Uh, it's since the the birth of CrossFit, it's a very common thing because they yeah, test. PR was not a thing. Well, it, it was bench press was the but only bench thing. press was how much do you max? Yeah, that yeah, was that it. was that was. But the nobody, thing. Was nobody was talking about max. Nobody was talking about their PR and anything else. No, right? no, nothing. And and even then, I again, I didn't, I I did not believe in maxing out. Like I just didn't. I wasn't a strength. I was, I didn't uh, value strength the same way. I was all about aesthetics. And I had learned early on that I could build a pretty good looking physique, and never in my life max out. And I knew that when I was teaching clients, that was always the safest route. So I was the trainer who kind of actually avoided it with this chip on my shoulder a little bit. Like you max out. That's stupid. What's your goal? <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you a power lifter? Oh, you're not a power lifter. Why the fuck are you doing yeah. that? I remember you just all, all show, no go. Bro. That's why I, I was just like, what? Like yeah. it didn't even compute with me. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you, why would you brag about like, that? What? Yeah. Like, like, no girl ever asked like, you in the, threw me in the bedroom what your PR is. Yeah. That's exactly what I used to say. Yeah, I I, and, and, and honestly, most people that go to the gym, you know, most people there, of course there's exceptions to the rule they're listening right now, but most people are going there to change their aesthetics. They want to, they want to lose their fat. They want to build a little bit of muscle. They want to look better. They want to feel better. They want to feel sexy. And what I pieced together early on was, you know what? None of that. It, you, you do not have to ever train like a strength or a powerlifting no. athlete to achieve that. There's very little value to it for the average person. I mean, right. I can I can make a case for some value, but reality, you're 100% well, right. Well, what, what I'll make the case for and what breaking beyond that happened for me, and we've shared this a little bit on the podcast, is I have a different looking physique today than what I did eight years ago. Um, and and it's due to lifting heavy weight. Like I've built it. It's it's so hard to explain. It's density. Yeah. Somebody it's who, density. obviously somebody who's who's been here and done both understand it's really hard for me to articulate this to a to a, a new lifter. But when and when I went from being the guy who only trained like hypertrophy type training for for a decade, and then I went into strength training and incorporated strength training, I built a different looking muscle on my body. And in, and the best way that I could describe it is I, my hypertrophy that I had was, man, when I would get in the gym and I would lift and I'd get all aired up, I'd look great. I would look like, and I used to always say that, man, if I could just look more like what I look like all pumped up and aired up, which I know everybody can relate to, but I would really deflate after that. And sure, I looked kind of fit, but nowhere near what I looked like inside the gym. When I started lifting really, really heavy, 
I saw less of a pump, you know, from the workouts, but I started to build like this solid muscle. And I started to notice that, you know, just my arms hanging by my side, you could see my tricep, which you would only see that if I got them all aired up mm -hmm. in the past. And so, and the same thing goes for my legs and goes for my, like all of a sudden I built this muscle that didn't need to be aired up to look solid and big. And that's the best way I can describe that to people and the value of what strength training and heavy lifting did for my body yeah. and physique. But you absolutely could build it without it. Totally. Do you guys have a lift that, like a special lift that if you are if you want to like work out with someone and you just know you'll crush them at? You have like this one lift that, well, dead that you know you could bro. do? Dead lifting is, there's not many, you're probably one of the few people that in our circle that can, you know, other than fucking our like power lifting buddies, like Ben Polk, the average gym goer, there's not, there's definitely nobody in my men's physique group that I hung out with that could <laughs> out dead. No, I have, a, I have a, I have a lift. There's one lift that I could, that I did and I don't even exercise this anymore, but I knew I could, whoever I was working out with, I would freak them out about the amount of weight I could use. And that was a reverse grip, uh, re reverse curl. <laughs> For whatever reason, it's like the dumbest exercise ever. But I put a forty-five the only on, one on the plant that worked on. Yeah, that. I put a forty-five <laughs> on the bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get him on this. Just a simple, <laughs> stupid exercise. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's all right. That's like my mace bell thing. You know, like yeah. I'll, I'll take the heaviest mace bell you could possibly give me, and I'll fucking crush it out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who cares? <laughs> yeah. Next question is from Molly on Fire. I would love to hear how each of your careers in fitness began. Oh man, we haven't told this story in a little while, have we? No. Yeah, I mean, Sal, I you mean on everybody else's podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, t I mean, I think I, t I tell this uh, all the time. In fact, I just did a, an, an episode that I think goes live next Friday that I thought I probably shared this story the best, in my opinion, of all the interviews I've done. So when that comes out, I'll, I'll share it in my story. But you and I, I mean, Sal, Sal and I have, a, I think, a, a relatively similar story um, of. You know, I, I was, I actually was not uh, into, um, or I never thought I was going to be a personal trainer. Uh, when I was younger, I was driven uh, to make money. And I was interested in being an architect. I was interested in being a lawyer. Yeah, you're not going to pick fitness. Yeah, I did not. I <laughs> wanted to make money. That was like, that was Fitness my, is not the field. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was my main goal was to make money. And I didn't think that fitness would be that. I actually... Uh, and even when I bought my first national certification when I was uh, 18, I actually thought it would be, I remember, I'll never forget this. We were in a gym in Modesto and working out there. And my buddy and I were, were, were in junior college and we're, we're talking about degrees and things like that. And we're, un, we're uncertain what we're going to declare as when we, when we eventually have to. And we're talking about jobs, things that we're currently doing. And there's one of these personal trainers in there. And we, I think he actually said at first, he's like, you know, it'd be cool. Like side job while we're going through school is personal training, man. We love working out so much. And I'm like, yeah, that would be a cool. And that's actually what made me go home that night. And I bought a national cert and I bought it with the intention of, Hey, that would be a cool side job while I went to school. That was how that really mm -hmm. started. I just assumed they didn't make any money because I didn't know any trainers that were rich or had. And then and that for me, that's what all I was driven by. So then I, I have the national certification. I'm going through junior college. I'm on my second year. I notice I'm kind of dicking around. I'm in my hometown. I, I've, I moved out of my own place when I was 17 years old. I'm partying. I have a keg on my fucking you know balcony. So we're partying like every weekend. At that thing, at that time, I thought it was cool to skip as many classes as I could, but yet still pass all the tests. You know, yeah. so just, that's kind that's, of that's a that's that a, a move. That's a sign that you're an entrepreneur, by the way. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it is. I, I did that. I, I remember, I was so proud. I passed with a C. Right. I showed up like four times. Right. Yeah. That, and so, and I and I'm I've always prided myself on being a pretty self aware person, and so I realize this about myself. I'm. You know, hanging out with my my buddies, we're partying on the weekends, we're skipping class. You know, I'm chipping away at nine units a semester, and I and I find myself. I'm 20 years old, and I'm like, I'm not going to get stuck in this town. Uh, I don't. I, I I want more for myself. I can't. I can't fuck around with this school thing anymore. I need to get this done. And I had a grandmother who lived in San Jose, and my grandmother uh, had a two bedroom. Uh, apartment that she she owned that I knew that I could go uh, live in one of the rooms and I could go to school. Now, what I also had found out this around the same time was that San Jose State was known for kinesiology. So I thought, oh, this is cool. I'll transfer over. I'll finish my AA at De Anza. 
and then I'll transfer to San Jose and just since I'm into this working out thing and I'm already interested in being kind of a personal trainer, maybe I'll go down this kinesiology to, to direction and see where maybe the maybe I'll be a physical therapist. Now I'm thinking like I'm going to be a physical therapist like because I know that's more money than a personal trainer. So that's kind of where my head is at. So I moved to San Jose the very first week that I'm there. I walk across the street at, and there's a 24-hour fitness and I go to get a membership there. When I'm filling out the profile of the membership that asks how you heard about 24-hour fitness. Well, I had never heard of 24-hour fitness until I bought that national certification because it said that 24-hour fitness recognized it. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time I even heard of what 24-hour fitness was. So I put it on there. Oh, my IFPA national certification. Instantly that got the attention of the man general manager. He went and got the fitness manager. Fitness manager came over, gave me this whole spiel. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't have my degree. I don't have this. I haven't passed the test yet. I just bought it. They asked how I found about it. And he's like, no, 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 it's okay. We we have 24 Fitness University and you can take this test and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm not looking for a job. I'm actually, come, I moved to San Jose to go full-time school. And they go, well, you could even work part-time. And so, and you get a free membership. So I'm like, okay. I passed their little test and I'm like, okay, I'll go part-time personal training. This is cool. This I just landed this job that I was already interested in doing as a side hustle while I was going to college. And I started and I had about three months or two, two or three months before the next semester was starting in De Anza and because I couldn't get enrolled in the, I, it was too late for the current one that was happening. So I had like a three month run rate before I was going to register for the next, the next semester. And I start this job and I fucking fall in love with it. I mean, every aspect of it. Uh, I, I, I loved being there. I loved working with people. I loved learning about the body and nutrition and, and all the knowledge that I was starting to consume uh, for myself selfishly. And then what I was teaching and giving people, it was just a fucking blast. And then, you know, you go from, I was a kid who started at $4.50 $4 an hour, worked his way up to $7 an hour to all of a sudden I'm making $70,000 a year as a personal trainer. It was like, holy shit. And every check that I made every two weeks was significantly bigger than the last one. And now, and I've got my, my boss at the time is in my ear and he's like, you were meant for this. You got to do this. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm here. I got to finish school. And I'm thinking, I'm like, fuck, I told all my family that I was going to go to school and this is what I was going to do. Like everybody's going to be pissed. My grandma bought me a computer and desk just for, I can do all my fucking homework. Like, so I'm stressing out about telling me that. And I'm going, I'm 20 years old right now. If I listen to this this guy who's telling me that I'm made for this and I can make all this money, if I listen to him and I give everything I got for one year and and then assess at the end of the year, is it what everybody says it's going to be? Um, I'm only 21. I still got almost my AA. It's not like I'm really behind my peers yet. Okay, I, I think I, I think I'll try this. And I pissed everybody off. You know, my grandma was disappointed. My uncles and aunts were disappointed. My parents were disappointed. But I knew. Um, that I was, I was still not not going to go to school. I was going to give this thing everything I got for one year to see if it could take me as far as what people are saying the potential it could take me. And man, in a year's time, mm -hmm. I mean, the rest is fucking history. I, I broke records. I I made as a twenty year old kid. I made seventy something thousand dollars my very first year. By the next year after that, I bought my house. I was now a six figure employee. I was in management. And it was real easy. And then they, and the real selling point for me, what, when, as I was falling in love with this career, where they were telling me that if you go get your four-year degree out of in kinesiology and you get a national certification, we pay you the same. And that was like the kind of the, the final thing for me was like, oh, you mean I could work, make all this money, continue to pursue my career, also educate myself on my own time at nighttime and on weekend courses and you will pay me the same that if I went through and dedicated four years of college and spend potentially, you know, 60 mm -hmm. to $100,000, I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. So that's kind of how uh, I got started in fitness and the rest is kind of history. So it's a, there's definitely some similar aspects to mine. Um, the, the difference is how it started. I, I started working out uh, at 14 years old and immediately fell in love with the weights. Immediately loved it. Absolutely loved it. I love the fact that I could – work my body. I could train myself. I could learn. And then I could see changes in myself and improvements in myself. And I mean, I would come home from school, you know, as a kid, 15 years old, 16 years old, and I would spend two hours in the backyard working out. Um, I, at the, at, when I was 15, I got a job 
washing dishes at a at a local pizzeria, and I'd save my money and I'd go to the to the the supplement store and I'd buy protein powders and you know I bought creatine when that first came out and I was studying these things. I bought chemistry books to study the chemicals in supplements so I could figure out which supplements were the right, right combinations and. I bought every single bodybuilding magazine and fitness bag. I absolutely loved it. In fact, I have old yearbooks and you can read what people write and all of them make a comment about something they're having to do with working out because I was so obsessed with it. So I knew that I was going to get into a field that was related to, to fitness. I just didn't know, I didn't think of the gym because I thought that there was no career in gyms. I thought that the careers revolving around fitness revolved around things like physical therapy. So same thing. I thought, okay, I'm going to go to school for physical therapy. Um, graduate high we school. We all have that in common. Yeah, exactly. By the way. <laughs> graduate what high were school. Because you know why? We're all money motivated. Yeah. And yeah. We all, but yeah, I wanted to be But there. I want fitness. You're yeah. going to hear that from me too. Yeah. So I, I thought to myself like, cool, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to school for physical therapy. But in the meantime, I'm going to go become a personal trainer. Um, and I used to work out at the 24 fitness on Hillsdale. I had a membership there since I was uh, 16 years old my dad, you know, would drive me. And then when I had my license, I drove myself and I went up to the front desk and I asked them, Hey, how do I apply to become a personal trainer? And they said, well, you have to be 18 at the time. I think I was 16 and a half or 17. So I waited. I'm like, okay, I got to be 18 years old. And I waited until like literally my fucking birthday. And I was like, I'm 18. I'm going to go apply. So it was probably, I don't know, a month or two after I turned 18, I walk in and you got to keep this, keep in mind, I was a very, I'm a very different person than I was as a kid, but there's some things that were very similar. And I was just a very assertive 18 year old. I wasn't your typical teenage kid. So I walked up to the front desk and I said, I'd like to speak to your manager. So <laughs> <laughs> manager Doesn't wa- surprise me at all. Manager walks out. His name is uh, uh, Sean Winters. He was my, he was the fitness manager at the time. He walks around the corner and I shake my hand and I'm like, I want to be a personal trainer here. And he's like, oh, okay. I talked to him for five minutes, five minutes and he's like, you're hired. <laughs> I think it was my, it was because he saw my personality. I was very oh, much man, like- Oh man, I remember being a fitness manager. If you got a kid that was- 18 year old, I'm going to be a trainer. Yeah. So that was me. So he's like, you're hired. So I'm like, cool. So he hires me. Um, I become a personal trainer. The, the first day I start- he has this other trainer shadow me. Now, remember, I knew nothing about the business of fitness. I didn't know how I got paid. I don't know what that looked like. Um, I remember when he hired me, I asked him how much you make. And he says, oh, you can make up to 30 bucks an hour. So I thought that's what I got, 30 bucks an hour. So I came in the next day and I'm fucking like, yeah, I'm making this great job to have while I go to, you know, while, while I go sign up for, for some classes or whatever. And I'm, and he had me, he had this other trainer kind of have me follow this other trainer along who was the top trainer in the club. Now, back in those days, 24 hour fitness had just become 24, uh, sorry, they had just become 24 hour fitness. They were 24 hour Nautilus before they had merged or took over another large fitness chain. It was uh, Ray Wilson's family fitness and they changed their name to 24 hour fitness. And at this time, you know, you're talking 1997, Personal training was not a revenue source. It wasn't a big revenue. It was like a, it was something they were kind of trying to see if it would work, but all the revenue came from memberships. So here I am, I'm in this club, Hillsdale, which, you know, Club 504, if you're listening right now, that club now, or definitely later on, was producing tremendous amounts of revenue from personal training. But at the time, the whole club's goal, I think, was $13,000 for the whole month. Um, And the trainer that I was shadowing, he was like the top guy and he was doing like $2,000 or $2,500. And I remember because my, my fitness manager was like, I want you to follow. I'm not going to say his name because I'll embarrass him because he sucked. I'm going fo- to have you follow so-and-so around. He's our top trainer. And I'm like, oh, what makes you the top trainer? He's like, well, you know, I'm the top sales guy. I'm like, really? What do you sell? He's like, well, last month I did $3,000 and this month I'm already at $2,000. I had no concept. So I was like, wow, okay, whatever. So then he's showing me, he's, he's showing me around and he's, taking people through orientations. And orientations are when people buy a membership, they get a free orientation to the gym. And your job as a trainer is to show them how to use like five or six pieces of equipment, show them what they do, and then they're off on their own. Or they hire you as a personal trainer. So I follow him around and he's taking Mrs. Johnson or whoever through and he's like, here's a bicep curl, here's a chest press or whatever and does his thing. And then at the end, he asks him a few questions about personal training and the lady leaves. So I asked this guy, I'm like, wow, you fucking, we make 30 bucks an hour just for that? And he's like, no. He's like, we're making minimum wage. I'm like, excuse me? 
And I said, what do you mean we're making minimum wage? He's like, they have to hire you first. Then you make a percentage of the session. So I'm like, oh. I'm like, well, how much do we charge for personal training? Like, what's the deal? And he's like, oh, here. And he pulls out this sheet, and it has all the prices of personal training, and it ranged from like 40 to $60 an hour or something like that. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. Okay. So he says, hey, look, do you want to take the next guy, the next person through the orientation? I'm like, sure. He's like, do you feel confident? I'm like, yeah. He leaves. This fucker leaves. <laughs> first day. So yeah, first day. He took. He went through one orientation, and then he leaves. So I'm like, okay. Person walks in. This lady walks in. I'll never forget her. She comes in. Hey, how you doing? My name is Sal. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm your trainer for today. I'm gonna show you around. Come over here and sit at the desk with me. Fifteen minutes later, she bought ten sessions of personal training. Because <laughs> I'm like, you need to hire me. I'm gonna show. And literally, I remember what I told him. Like, look, I'm gonna show you around and use equipment, but you're not gonna know how to do a workout. Like, what are your goals? Now, keep in mind, I had no training. Nobody taught me how to do any of this stuff. So I show her the form, and I say, well, which one do you want? She's like, I think I'll start with 10 sessions. I'm like, perfect. Hold on one second. I walk all the way to the general manager's office. Darcy was my general manager. Knock on the door. She opens the door. I think I don't even think she met me yet, right? She's like, huh? And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a trainer here. I'm like, you're the manager? Yeah, yeah. I said, I have a lady who wants to buy 10 sessions. She's like, what? Really? I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay. So she's like, bring her to my office. So I bring her in. She signs her up. The lady leaves. So I think she assumed that this person, this lady walked up to me and asked me, hey, can I buy 10 sessions of training? Because yeah. she said nothing else. So now I have three more appointments that day. Next appointment walks in. It's a man. He walks in. I take him to the desk. I go back, Darcy's office, knock on the door. Hey, someone else wants to buy 10 sessions. <laughs> She's like, wait, are people walking up to you and asking you if they could buy a personal <laughs> training? Yeah. I'm like, no, these are orientations. <laughs> and, to, and she goes, you're not certified yet. I said, I know. I told them that. I told them that I'd be certified in about a month, and they said that they'd wait. So I schedule them out a, a month out. She's like, okay, take the guy back, <laughs> sign him up. He walks out. Next guy that he walks in, it's a kid. So this time, it's a young kid. He's like 16 years old. I still remember I remember this kid because I ended up, he ended up becoming a personal trainer later on. So he comes in. I take him in the back. He walks out the gym. So now he walks out, and I'm standing at the front at the front desk. The general manager walks out, and she goes, "What? A, did you have another? I thought you said you had another orientation." I'm like, "Oh yeah," I said. He went to go get his mom because he's going to buy ten sessions of training, and she goes, "Oh, Sal." She goes, "I got to tell you something." She goes, "When people say they're going to, you know, leave and come back, yeah, two percent return. Yeah, they don't come." Right as she's saying that, he walks in with his mom. Oh, here, oh, here's my manager. She can sign you up. So I sold three packages. My very first day of personal training. And within two days, I blew away the, the first guy. And my first month, remember, the goal of the club was $13,000. My first month, I think I sold like seven or $8,000 of personal training. Which is insane. Which is, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like nobody knows what's going on. So now the general manager takes me in the office. This is after like a week. And she sits me down. She's like, what are you doing? Yeah, you're my favorite person. What are you doing? I want to know what you're doing. I want to know whatever. So this time, during this time, I start going to school. I'm going to school. Fucking hate it. Can't stand it. Absolutely. For anybody who knows me, you can can you just try to imagine me sitting in a chair listening to a teacher, you know, writing up on the on the dry erase board or whatever. It's very difficult for me. So I'd sit there and all I think about is like, I can't wait till this class is over so I could go yeah. go to work. Go to work. Like this is <laughs> Draw fucking terrible. Like me. Yeah. Four months later, they offer me the fitness manager position. I still had no idea what I was doing at all. I remember the this is when 24 Hour Fitness at Apex, uh, which was uh, owned by Neil Spruce. This guy's a legend in the fitness space. And I remember uh, one of the representatives came down to the club because I was becoming a fitness manager. And they're like, hey, we heard about you. You're this new kid. You know, you're going to be a fitness manager. You're Apex Sales. You're crushing everybody. Um, we'd love you to come teach uh, our other trainers how to sell Apex and how to talk about Apex. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And I said, but I need you to like, help teach me what Apex is. <laughs> they were like, what? They go, what? I said, I don't know what it is. All I know is it's nutrition. And so I sell it because everybody needs nutrition. So they said, oh, we'll send you the class to go learn. We've bottled and, nutrition. Yeah, we'll send it. But anyway, I did that for a little while, became a general manager um, when I was 19, um, and just you were fucking one, loved you it. You were one of, the, one of or the youngest general, ma general manager ever, because yeah, I know yeah. I was one of the youngest fitness managers ever. Yeah, I, I was 19, just about to turn 20 when I became a general manager. Um, so I was the youngest at that point that I heard of. Uh, uh, in, in the company. I just fucking loved it. I love fitness. I love the gym. You know, I was making a shit ton of money. I had no idea, I had no concept of what a lot of money was. I, I remember I'd take my checks and I'd deposit them and just leave them there and go back to work. I had no idea what was a lot of money. 
I, I was going to school to be a physical therapist, and what convinced me to not go anymore was my hatred of school. Mm. Couldn't stand that. It yes. sucked. I had to take math classes to get my general, my AA or whatever, and I hated it. I think I showed up to one class, and I was like, fuck this. I'm not doing homework. <laughs> Couldn't stand it. And then I, the other thing that convinced me was I had a there was a member that was a physical therapist that told me how much she made. And I remember thinking, I'm making more than you. I'm not going to school anymore. This is all I'm going to do. And that was it. The rest was history. And, uh, and that's it. And then I, then I bought my own gym, uh, my own gym at 21. And uh, at 24, I had started my wellness studio. And that, that was it. The rest is history. Yeah, I could totally empathize with you and your disdain for school. Like, that's where it all began for me. I was at San Jose State and was there for two years and was just sloughing off and doing anything I could to just barely make it by, show up. And I was just really just interested on trying out for the football team, making the football team, working out, like being physical. Uh, and meanwhile, like, that was my entire focus. And, and I found, like... I had, I had like an opportunity to then go into the spring ball team. I had tried out and I had been like working my ass off to try and like make this team. And, uh, and then they, they cut it out from under me. They're like, you know what? We don't have a spot for you. And so I'm like, just in like, where, what the hell am I going to do with my life now? Like my girlfriend's at Cal Poly, you know, like I, I would find myself back and forth, like driving down there and that like half my life was there. I was like, San Jose State's weird. Cause it's kind of like a commuter school. So like a lot of people there, they don't really hang out, you know? So I would like take a bus there and I would just like spend all this time by myself. And I'm a pretty social person, you know, as much as people think I'm an introvert, I, I definitely like to hang out with people and like uh, be social. And so that was like wearing on me. And uh, I guess this guy had uh, shared a flight with my dad and was flying back from the Midwest. And my dad was out there for business and he was just talking to the guy. And the guy turns out to be a, a coach for this small school in Chicago. And he was like, you know what, my son, he was amazing. Like I, I had all these like accolades from when I was in high school, you know, that guy that has all the, you know, MVPs and, and, you know, won championships and all that shit. Uncle, Uncle Rico. Yeah, the Uncle Rico <laughs> stuff, right? I could throw a football really far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I had that to my name, you know, people in my area knew who I was. Uh, and I wasn't going to see any playing time anymore. I just kind of gave up on the idea of football. And then my dad was like, Hey, I met this guy on the plane. He's really interested in like you. And like, he's like, I already sent him all your old footage and highlights. I'm like, what? Like, really? Okay. Weird. And then I just like, uh, started to communicate with him and had a phone call. He really liked me. He's like, I didn't know this is how this played out. I had no idea about this. I didn't know your dad was the one who initially met the guy on a plane. Yeah. Yeah. He met, he met, uh, uh coach uh, Vanderkoy. He was a uh, really, really good guy. He, uh, he just he saw something in me and was like i want you know like wow. if, if you can if we can get you back to that type of playing it'd been two years for me outside of, of high school of playing actual football i mean i was training to try and get on d1 level um and i just was just on the brink of that and they just they, they didn't want to take a chance on me and so i was just like really deflated i was i was actually working at a, a junior college in san jose at san jose city college and i was working with their track team just to try my my weakness was speed and so my 40 time was shit. And uh, that was where I was really like working my ass off to get faster just just because all they care about was like these combine numbers. Yeah. And so that was my, my game speed, everything else, my athleticism, you know, like all the coaches recognized that and they, they saw how much of a beast I was in the weight room. And so they were like, yeah, we'll give you a chance, you know, and they kept giving me all these tryouts. And I had a grueling tryouts. When you're the guy that's like trying to get in on the team, like they fuck with you. <coughs> like they used to put me in like little scrimmages and things. This is before I was even on the team. And they would just like almost like bull in the ring kind of stuff and just smash you and just like, you know, work you into the ground in the see workouts. What, see what you could take. See huh? what you could take. I had to do a, a timed line. So liners, you'd go 25 yards back, you'd go 50 yards back, 75 yards back, 100 yards back, timed. If you didn't make that, you had to show up the next day at 5 a.m. and repeat it until you passed this time. It, oh. it took me two weeks uh, to pass that time. Oh, and so anyways, I was like throwing up. I was like, oh my God, I was like, just like adamant that I was going to make it though. Like, that was my entire goal. And I was just crushed that I didn't make it. And so anyway, so this was like a, a, a new opportunity for me. And, uh, I was trying to explain this to my girlfriend. She was obviously like not excited about the idea because I was going to be all the way on the other side of the country, you know, in Chicago. And then I was like, you know what? I've done everything for everybody else, you know, screw that. I'm just going to go. 
And so, and my, my parents were just super excited with this. I don't think they liked my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, like, let's get them to go. And so, uh, I went out to, to the Midwest and I, I, I had no friends out there and I was just like, you know, totally like, did I make the wrong decision? Is this crazy? And turns out like, I mean, that was, that was what I needed. I needed to find myself. Like this was all for me. I was really like all about fitness forever. I always loved being physical. I loved the training process, loved the off season, loved getting better. Uh, but that was always in the back burner. This is like, you know, like I want to either be, you know, in the NFL or I want to be a rock star. Those was, that was like my goals, like <laughs> very realistic, you yeah. know, very <laughs> not lofty at all. Not, not lofty. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like stuff you still think about as a little kid. Like I had that like goal in mind and, uh, quickly realized that the, at the college level, like I could do well and I could handle, uh, you, you know, I could like step up to the plate, but I was never going to be like shining like I was at the high school level. So I just was just like, you know what, what am I doing? Like I'm grinding my ass off and like beating myself up to try and become something I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, like it, I'm not going to take steroids you know, like that was like thrown at me a bunch through the process. And I was just like, I, I just couldn't do it. I just wasn't like, and I was like, this is as strong and fast as I can be. Like this is it. And so I started to, to play music. Music. And I thought that, <laughs> okay, I'm really into music. I'm going to play in this band. And I had a couple guys that were on the team that were just like, he, like me, like they just loved, you know, goofing off, playing music. I, I, we started a band with this guy I was rooming with. He was the drummer. Uh, we recruited somebody from another school. We're like touring around Chicago playing music. And I'm, I'm the guy that's setting up all the scheduling of all the dates, the appearances, like all this kind of stuff. Like I was like really gung ho. I'm like, we're going to, we're going to get signed dude, you know, like we're going to make it. <laughs> and then like, it was after I graduated from college, I stayed there for an extra year to try and really be like, am I just like, like I, I still had some rational, realistic, like, look, this is a totally a dream, a pipe dream. Like let's, let's have some realism and I need a real job, <laughs> you know? And so I started interning with this, uh, with this place in Chicago that was like, it was like our dream setup. So there was, there's physical therapists there. There was massage therapist there. There was, you know, an ortho there. There was like all these like super like well-established professionals um, that uh, like, like, like wealthy people would come in and they have a gym membership, but they could have like access to all, you know, these physicians and uh, you know, some pro athletes would actually go through there and stuff. And I totally took it for granted. I was just like, you know, eh, whatever. Like I had had a good time, you know, just training people. And then I started going back to campus and training people just as sort of like a side gig. But meanwhile, I was like bartending and doing all that and then trying to become a, you know, a rock star. And, and so, uh, you know, it all kind of came to a, to a head and I made my way back to, to California cause I just missed home. I was very homesick. And, uh, and, and that's where I was like, I'll do anything at this point. Like I need to like, do I have to go back to construction? You know, yeah. maybe I'll go back to construction and I'll just do that for a living. And I, I drove past the 24 hour fitness and I just saw something in the window. They were looking for, for trainers. They're looking for help. And this is in Santa Cruz. And, uh, I was like, wow, that's interesting. I never even thought like that would be like a career that I could do. And I was like, maybe I'll try this out. And I was there for maybe, I don't know if it was a week and I was going through orientation and they, they saw that I had a degree. So that helped. Um, and they were like, you know, we'll put you on the floor, try you out and all this. But I guess at the time they just didn't have that much business. And they're like, you know what? We have another opportunity actually, like over in San Jose, I think, you know, it'd be a better fit if you're willing to drive and commute. I'm like, you know, I'm willing to do whatever. Like, I just, I want to, I just want to work and make money and, and be, you know, self-sufficient. And so I just decided to do that. And that's where I, you know, I, I connected with Adam and we went to, um, Hillsdale and then, uh, went to that, like that funny little course with a couple of the guys that were new hires at the time, Nick. And, um, uh, I like subtly, like I was super, super competitive. Like I didn't want it to be obvious, you know, <laughs> I knew I didn't have the ultimate, Hey, Hey, look at me, everybody charisma. Like that's just not me, <laughs> but I wanted to crush you. I wanted to crush everybody. And like, I, I was picking everybody apart. Who's the best trainer? What do they do? Like, well, how do they talk to, to their clients? Like what's, what's, why are they carrying clipboards? What is this all about? Like, why, 
why can't I do this with the client? Like, so I was like breaking it all down and I, I was writing it all every night. I was writing it down every single night, writing it down. I'd come in with a plan, you know, and I just, that, that was like my safety net. It was like, <laughs> I had a plan every single day for every one of my clients. Like, and so I just, I just really was like methodical in the beginning as much as I could. And then like later, like I realized, oh, wow, like I know what to do. I know what to do. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. And then I started to really flourish and uh, be comfortable. When I was comfortable, I started attracting more people. And then I started like building this really big base of clients. Then I started breaking records in the company, um, you know, and then obviously applying a lot of the techniques, sales techniques. I didn't have that before. Like it was great to learn all that stuff. Uh, and just, it was really just a confidence thing for me. It takes me a while to really feel like, uh, like I put myself all the way out there. Like, Oh, I'm so awesome. Like it takes me a while to say I'm awesome. And once I got to that place, it was like, it all kind of was like, Oh, well, this was the best thing I could have done for myself. And I loved it. So awesome. And now we're here. Yep. Yeah. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. If you want to follow Awesome Justin, follow him at Mind Pump Justin. I'm awesome. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam, and I'm at Mind Pump Sal.